Welcome to your New Deal video. We're going to be talking about the first and second New Deal as well as FDR becoming president. So let's just jump right into it. Um, in 1928, President Hoover basically, you know, was a shoo in He was definitely going to win. But that all changed by 1932, when Hoover had basically no chances of winning his re-election. The Depression, you know, was had already started. You had 25% of the population that was unemployed. Bank failures had wiped out people's entire life, si life savings. Hungry people were waiting on long lines at soup kitchens. And Americans were really ready for a change. So... In July of 1932, when you have kind of an unknown politician, except the Democratic nomination for president, um, people started to take notice. Now, FDR, as a child, was actually very wealthy. He grew up in a very privileged household. Um, and FDR, Franklin, ends up marrying his distant cousin, Eleanor Roosevelt, which you see in that top left picture. And... President Theodore Roosevelt, which we learned about in the past, is actually Eleanor's uncle and Franklin's fifth cousin as well. So FDR, you know, f cousins with um, Teddy Roosevelt, he has some of that politician's blood in him. And he was definitely a rising star in the Democratic Party. Now, you guys probably know him from being in a wheelchair. And that happened when he was diagnosed with polio. So in the summer of 1921, while vacationing, FDR slipped off of his boat and he went into the chilly waters of the North Atlantic. That night, he woke up with a high fever. He had um, severe pains in his legs and his back. And then two weeks later, he was officially diagnosed with polio, which at that time had no treatment whatsoever. Um, because of that diagnosis, he was never able to fully recover the use of his legs, hence why he uses a wheelchair. But he never let that stop him. And in 1928, he becomes governor of New York. And then a mere four years later, he becomes president of the United States. And you can see that he won the election by a huge landslide. When FDR came into office, he pledged a new deal. Even though he didn't really know what that meant, he definitely knew that the federal government had to take an active role in providing recovery and relief to Americans. So he was going to try out a bunch of different things, but he knew that the federal government needed to play a bigger role, which is the opposite of what President Hoover has said before. So to help him plan out this new deal, FDR sought the advice of a diverse group of men and women. Um, which he named, nicknamed the Brain Trust. And Roosevelt, who is a Democrat, actually nominated two Republicans to serve in his candidate, in his cabinet, I'm sorry, as well as Frances Perkins, who was a social worker, and she served as his Secretary of Labor. She became the first female cabinet member in U.S. history. So it's Frances Perkins. Throughout his presidency, FDR relies heavily on his wife, Eleanor. She traveled widely to interact with the American people, and she kind of served as FDR's eyes and ears on the ground. Um, in 1933, when the Bonus Army, which you guys learned about in the last video, marched on D.C., uh, instead of having the military go there and evict the Bonus Army like Hoover did, FDR sent Eleanor and she sang songs with the veterans and made them feel like the government actually cared. And you can see her kind of sitting there in the middle of all of them. So during his first 100 days in office, FDR proposes and Congress passes 15 bills. So these measures were known as the First New Deal. And it had three basic goals, which are the three R's. Relief, recovery, and reform. Roosevelt wanted to provide relief for the immediate hardships of the Depression and to achieve long-term economic recovery. He also instituted reform to prevent future depressions from happening. So it seems like it makes sense. Roosevelt wasted no time. There we go. Roosevelt wasted no time in um, dealing with the nation's number one crisis, which was basically the bank failures. So the day after his inauguration, he calls Congress into a special session and he convinces them to pass laws that are basically going to shore up the nation's banking system. So the Emergency Banking Relief Act gave the president a bunch of um, 
or broad powers, let's say, including the power to declare a four-day bank holiday. So for four days, banks all over the country were ordered to close, and the closing gave banks time to get their accounts in order before they reopened for business again, only if they actually had enough money to give back to or to pay back to their depositors. Eight days after becoming president, FDR delivers an informal radio speech to the American people. So this was the first of many what is called fireside chats. They became an important way for Roosevelt to communicate with the American people because, you know, radio was basically all there was. And in his first fireside chat, FDR explains that he has taken the measure to kind of stem the run on the banks. His calming words helped to reassure the American people, and when the bank holiday ended and the banks reopened, Americans didn't rush to withdraw their money from the banks because Roosevelt had convinced them that the banks were a safe place to keep their money. FDR also created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC, which you guys often see on... um, on banks, or you hear in bank commercials, and it insures bank deposits for up to $5,000. In the following year, FDR took it a step further, and he created the SEC, which is Securities and Exchange Commission, to regulate the stock market and to make it a safe place for investments. So these financial reforms helped to restore confidence in the economy. Americans now had confidence that they wouldn't lose their lifetime savings if a bank failed. Um, the stock markets had, you know, stabilized as a regulated trading practice also assured the investors themselves. A number of New Deal programs aimed at also easing the desperate plight of American farmers, which you guys, again, learned about in your last video. So Congress passes the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which sought to end overproduction and raise crop prices. The AAA provided financial aid, um, paying farmers subsidies to not plant on part of their land and to kill off excess livestock. And by 1934, farm prices began to rise. So they were actually paying farmers not to farm and paying farmers to kill off their livestock that wasn't needed in order to try to live within their means. The TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, built a series of dams in the Tennessee River Valley to control floods and to generate electric power. The agency was also tasked with replanting forests, um, building different fertilizer plants, creating jobs, and it attracted the industry with the promise of cheap power. To counter the Depression's devastating impact on the young men who couldn't find a job, FDR creates the CCC, the Civilian conservation corps and the ccc um gives a job to more than two million young men they would replant forests build trails dig irrigation ditches they fought fires as time went on the programs became um more inclusive and it extended work and training to mexican americans and to other minority youth as well to whites fdr actually called the ccc his favorite new deal program Congress passed a bunch of other relief acts. You had the CWA, the Civil Works Administration, which was short-lived, but it provided jobs on public works projects. Another front that Congress created was the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which loans money at low interest rates to homeowners who could not meet mortgage payments. Um, And then you have the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, that ensured bank loans used for building or repairing homes. Roosevelt called the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, the most important and far-reaching legislative that Congress had ever created. And that's because it worked with businesses and labor unions in developing codes for fair competition. So it established, you know, minimum wages, minimum um, prices for goods that businesses sold. And the idea behind these codes was to increase the wages of workers so they could buy more goods and raise prices so that companies can make a profit. The last New Deal legislative achievement was the um, Public Works Administration, the PWA, which built bridges, dams, power plants, government buildings, and they were responsible for building a lot of the important things that you still see today. Um, New York City's Triborough Bridge was built under this program. The Overseas 
highway linking Miami to Key West was built under this program. The Bonneville Dam that's on the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest, again, built with this program. So these public work projects improve the nation's infrastructure while creating millions of jobs for workers. These New Deal measures that we just covered definitely marks a clear break from the policies of the Hoover administration, which um, is very different than what FDR was saying because FDR was getting the federal government involved. And here is a breakdown of the New Deal's three major goals. Relief for the unemployed, plans for economic recovery, and reforms to prevent another depression. So all of these um, programs that we talked about, the AAA, the CCC, the TVA, the CWA, um, the NRA, the PWA, all these, all these different letters, these acronyms, was all about these three R's, relief, recovery, reform. Now, not everyone approved of the New Deal. Um, while Roosevelt had very little difficulty getting support from Congress, a minority of Americans expressed their opposition to it. Some thought that the changes were a little too radical, and then others thought that the New Deal wasn't radical enough, so it just depends on who you would ask. Several of FDR's critics, though, attracted um, mass followings and actually made plans to challenge him for the presidency in the election of 1936. Senator Long of Louisiana wanted to um, put heavy taxes on the rich, and he wanted to use those taxes to give to the American families that were really poor to buy a house, to buy a car, to have a decent income. And Roosevelt viewed him as an actual serious political threat. But unlike Roosevelt, Long didn't have a deep faith in democracy. Um, he kind of ruled Louisiana like he almost owned the state, and so he made a lot of enemies. And in 1935... He was actually assassinated, so that kind of ended the most serious threat there was to Roosevelt's presidency in the election of 1936. But then you had a, a priest, Father Charles Conlon. He provided an even bigger challenge to FDR because he attracted millions of listeners on his weekly radio show. And at first, Father Charles actually supported the New Deal, but in time he, he um, accused FDR of not doing enough to fight the Depression. And Father Conlon criticized FDR on his radio show for not taking stronger action against bankers and rich investments. He was Canadian by birth, so Father Connolly couldn't run for president, but he did threaten to throw his support behind Senator Long before he passed away, so that could have also been dangerous. Members of the American Liberty League complained that New Deal interfered too much with businesses and the lives of people, like the federal government was too involved. And the ALL felt that Roosevelt had deserted what the Democratic Party actually represented, which at that time was limited federal government. And then finally, the last critic would be Francis Townsend, who was a doctor from California, and he had a simple program. Basically, he proposed giving every American who was over the age of 60 a pension of $200 per month. However, people receiving this pension would have to retire, which means that they would be freeing up a job for a younger American. And in addition, every person that received a pension would be required to spend it immediately in order to like jumpstart the economy. To promote this plan, he created the town said clubs, and he held meetings that resembled almost like old-time church revivals. Um, and even though it was a critic, he didn't necessarily gain too much traction. So here you have a political cartoon, and it's broken up into three parts. I want you guys to think about it and try to answer the two questions that you see. Now we're going to the second New Deal. So we know what the first New Deal was about. It was about relief, recovery, and reform. Progress was made, but there was still a lot more work that needed to be done. So beginning in early 1935, Roosevelt launched an aggressive campaign to find solutions to ongoing problems that, caused, that were caused by the Great Depression. And this is what becomes known as the Second New Deal, which created Social Security and other programs that still have a huge impact on our lives today. So in his fireside chats and different press conferences and addresses and things of that nature, Roosevelt explains that the challenges that were facing um, the nation were 
for the federal government to promote the general welfare and to intervene to protect citizens' rights. So he uses the legislation passed during the Second New Deal to accomplish these goals. And he addresses the problems of the elderly, the poor, and the unemployed, creating new public works projects, which would help farmers, and enacted measures to protect workers' rights. It was during this period that the first serious challenges to the New Deal come through during the second New Deal period. All of these programs were really expensive and the government paid for them with money that they didn't have. So the federal deficit was $462 million in 1932. Four years later, by 1936, it had grown to $4.4 billion. The WPA built or improved a good part of our nation's highways, it drenched rivers and harbors, and promoted soil and water conservation. Um, in addition to creating a pension system for retirees, the Social Security Act also establishes unemployment insurance for workers who lose their jobs, and it created insurance for, vict for victims of work-related accidents, and to provide aid for poverty-stricken mothers and children, the blind, the disabled. But the Social Security Act had a lot of flaws. At first, it did not apply to domestic or farm workers. And even though African Americans were disproportionately employed in these fields, they were not eligible for the benefits of Social Security. Widows received smaller benefits than widowers because people assumed that elderly women could manage on less money than elderly men. Uh, despite these shortcomings, Social Security proved popular and pretty significant. The REA loaned money to electric utilities to build power lines and to bring electricity to isolated rural areas that still didn't have electricity. The program was successful. More than 80% of American farms now had electricity, so that was good. The Wagner Act um, recognized the rights of employees to join labor unions and gave workers the right to collective bargaining. So that's another positive thing. And then the last one would be the Fair Labor Standards Act, which provided workers with additional rights, establishing a minimum wage. And that minimum wage was 25 cents an hour, and it had a maximum work week of 44 hours per week. It also outlawed child labor. So... FDR wins re-election in 1936 overwhelmingly, and you can see by that map over there. He received 61% of the vote compared to 37% for his Republican challenger. Roosevelt carries basically every single state except for Maine and Vermont, and he enters into a second term determined to challenge the group that he considers to be the number one enemy of the New Deal, and that is the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court has struck down many of his New Deal programs as unconstitutional. And they said that the president did not have the power to do several of the things that FDR did. So in February 1937, FDR unveiled a program that would dilute or water down the power of the sitting justices on the Supreme Court. And his plan was to add six new justices to the nine-member um, Supreme Court cabinet. And he justified this proposal by stating that the Constitution does not specify the number of judges on the court. And he added that many of the justices were old and overworked. So if they were to add more um, justices, it would help out the workload. Now, critics recognized that Roosevelt would just appoint people that supported the New Deal, and they called his plan court packing. They accused him of trying to increase presidential power and upsetting the balance of the checks and balance system in the federal government. Now, obviously, Roosevelt's idea to increase the Supreme Court justices from 9 to 15 doesn't pass. However, this plan does cause FDR to kind of lose momentum. The court doesn't strike down any more laws after 1937, but Roosevelt found that the public was much less willing to support the New Deal. Um, many Americans felt that FDR was unfairly trying to control the Supreme Court and obviously didn't fare very well. The turmoil over the Supreme Court had barely, fa had barely faded when FDR faced yet another crisis. 
So during 1935 and 1936, economic conditions had kind of begun to improve. Unemployment had fallen 10% in four years. The economy was doing better. And so FDR decides that he's going to cut back on federal spending and he's going to re reduce the rising deficit. But he miscalculates this move. When Roosevelt reduces federal spending and the Federal Reserve Board raises interest rates, which makes it more difficult for businesses to expand and for consumers to borrow money to get new things. Suddenly, the economy goes into yet another tailspin. Unemployment soared to more than 20 percent and nearly every, everything, all the gains that had been done in employment and production were wiped out. Largely because of this downturn, the Democrats suffered a setback in the 1938 congressional elections. And although the Democrats still had the majority in both the House of Representatives and the Congress, Roosevelt's power base was shaken because many of now the Southern Democrats were kind of lukewarm supporters of the New Deal. And he um, would neither support to get his foreign policies passed. So because things were a little bit shaky for FDR, he chooses to not force any more reforms, New Deal reforms through Congress. And we kind of, we're going to leave it off here because this is a summary of the New Deal. And you can see the economic downturn that we were just talking about where he miscalculates and you can see the, the rise in, from 1937 to 1939, how you have more people go on unemployment. Now, here are 10 questions that you guys should have the answers to if you took excellent notes. And we have reached the end of our video. See you guys tomorrow. Thanks.